Great. Okay, so let's talk about color in ggplot. Um, this really allows you to get a lot out of your ggplots, I think, and really make them kind of unique and fun. So I think it's going to be fun today. So first, we are going to just yeah load in tidyverse as always, and we're going to load the um, the penguins data set. I think we've worked with this before, but in case you haven't seen it or don't remember, this is a really easy to work with data set that just has like three different species of penguin on I think three different islands. And it tells you some specs about like how long their bills are and how wide their flippers are, what gender and so on, or what sex. So we read that in just for ease of working with it today. We just dropped all NAs anywhere just so that we don't have to worry about NAs when we're working with our plots today. So in order to play with some of this color stuff, we need to have some ggplots to work with. So I've made a couple of ggplots that we can play with. So first one is a scatter plot. For this one, I am um, looking at flipper on the x-axis, so how long the flippers are in millimeters, and body mass on the y-axis. And we're using geom point, so that's why it's all dots. And then we've just added like some basic labels and then theme minimal for now. So theme minimal was just gonna take out the gray background for us and give us like a white clean background that we can more easily play with a little bit of color. So this is the first one, we call it penguins flipper because it's um, flipper length. Uh, that's one of the main variables. Okay, so that's that for now. We have this one, which is a, another scatter plot where we're looking at bill length and bill depth. And this also has um, like a trend line. So we have two geomes here, geome point and geome smooth. Maybe I should um, just comment on that a little bit just in case you are less familiar with ggplot or you haven't done it in a while. So we are just, yeah, we're starting the ggplot call. We've given the data as penguins and then we've mapped um, some columns in the data set to aesthetic to aesthetics that ggplot will make. So specifically, all we've done is just given it like, which column should be shown on the x-axis, which column should be shown on the y-axis. And then we tell ggplot that we want to see the dots and to also see the trend line. So we have two geomes, the point and the smooth. This is just our labels call, and this is, again, the theme minimal. OK, so this one is called Penguin's Bill. We'll play with this some more later. And then we've also made a bar chart, which is um, We've called it Penguins Island. So we're saving these ggplots to two variables so we can pull them up later without having to type the code again. This one, I've thrown in an extra step here. So I piped the um, data to a filter command, a dplyr command. And I've just taken out the island Torgerson. And I took that out for actually a really basic <laughs> reason, which is that it only has one species of penguin. So it looks kind of weird when you start to put the colors and the penguins on the island. So I just took out that island so we have like a pretty um, bar chart. And um, I've gone ahead and already put position dodge into the geome here. If you know what that, if you know what that is, then you already know what that means, but um, that's for when we play with color later. But we'll get there. Okay, so basically now we have three very basic GD plots that we can work with. Yeah, and we've saved them all to variables. Um, yeah. So with ggplot, there are two options for working with color that we're gonna have to consider like pretty much every time that we work with color in ggplot. And that would be um, whether or not we're trying to define an actual color as, as ggplot understands it, or if we're trying to define a fill. And the basic way to understand this is just that color is used for small areas. So like dots or lines, anything that's small. And fill is used when you're filling in like a big area, like um, a bar, like a bar of a bar chart or a background of a plot. So this will keep coming up over and over, but it's always like a decision that you have to make is, am I really looking for a color or am I looking for a fill argument? And so let's, yeah, let's look at this one. This is Penguin's Island. I think that's our bar chart. And so um, the cool thing here is that we've saved the ggplot as a variable. So you can see it here in my um, environment. It looks kind of weird because it kind of says that it's a list, but it's, it's a ggplot. So if I call um, 
penguins island then i get back this ggplot that we made this bar chart and i can also go ahead and add things to it that weren't there before so i can plus um, add the AE, a, add an additional AES aesthetic mapping with fill. So you could, of course, um, have written this in here. Fill equals island, for example. But because we're going to use these a lot, I've just saved it as variable. And here we can just add fill is island. So you can see these are the ggplot standard colors, kind of a bright orange red and this bright blue. And this is using the fill aesthetic, but if we would have done it with a color aesthetic, it's not going to complain or throw an error. It's just going to color only this like very thin line around the bars. So that's a good way to keep in mind that what is fill and what is color is that fill fills up big spaces. Um, so here we've just colored based on information that's already in the plot, but we can also add additional information into the plot through color. So color is not just something that you can use um, aesthetically, but you can also use it to incorporate more or different types of information into the plot. So here, for example, if instead I instead of mapping it to island, I map it to species, which is a part of the data that's not represented in this plot right now. But if I add that, then this plot becomes more informative because it now includes information of what kind of penguin is on each island. Okay, and I could have also done that with color, but it wouldn't have looked very helpful. So I could have done it with color. Um, oh, now I've already saved it back over top. But Okay, this see when I did this um, one, I actually saved the information on top, so I can no longer look at it without that there. But if I look at color, then you would see that it just these outlines of the blocks, but it still has the same function of like adding this information to the plot and therefore like changing changing the way that the plot displays by now making it have these two bars. Um, yes, so now we can add the color information. Great, so that's a categorical data, but like, let's see what happens when we add color to penguins flippers. So that was our scatter plot. So if we add the aesthetic mapping of color to body mass on um, this flipper graph, you can see that it has sort of a different function. So first of all, it shows up now with different shades of blue. Whereas here, remember at first we got this like blue and orange contrast, but here we have like light blue to dark blue. And that's how that's because ggplot is using this to show like a scale of values. So it's scaling from lower to higher values. Here we've used the same um, column that's already mapped onto the x axis. So it's not giving us any more information. It's just making the dots that are like higher up on the y axis a lighter blue and the ones that are lower a darker blue. Um, this one you can see. So this is the the, the one with lines, the scatter plot and lines. And you can see here I've added species as well. And this has had the same type of effect that it had when I did it on the bar chart, which is that now we kind of have separated out these groups into different, yeah, based on species using color as an argument. And this is kind of cool because you can see here that now like each of the each of the penguin types gets its own trend line as well. So it's it's split this up into three subgroups. And here we just did color because dots and lines are colors. But um, if you want to also fill in this entire sort of error bar, then we can map both fill and color to the same thing, species. And that will color in those error bars as well. OK, so that was a very quick recap of um, ggplot and how it deals with color. Are there any questions before we get on to custom colors? OK. Feel free to ask um, if you have any questions with ggplot because sometimes little things can trip you up. Okay, so custom colors. Now, when we deal with custom colors, we're always going to have to also keep in mind fill and color. So that's not that's going to be something that's going to come up over and over. Is are we looking to map it to what is already existing as a fill or as what is existing as a color? But when we work with custom colors, is a further distinction, which is that it always 
want, we always have to choose between manual and gradient colors. And I'm gonna go over this again, but just to preview what, what's coming, um, we use manual when we're using something that's categorical. So like this, we have words group um, membership, but we use um, can a gradient for when it's like a numeric variable so it can scale up like step-by-step. Step. It's not group membership, but it's something that can increase or decrease sort of in smaller or bigger steps. Okay, so I want to show this, which if you open that, okay. So these are the custom, uh, these are the colors that come built in in R. Oops. And you can see that R has like, I think over 400 different colors that are built in to R that you can use with, that you can call with these like descriptive names. So um, you can also see them here under the colors command. And oh yeah, actually there's 600 plus colors. So here you can see them just in words, like if you're looking for a certain color and it's not that important to you, what exactly it looks like, you can try and pick it from this list, or you can use this uh, reference sheet, which shows you the colors next to their names. And these are kind of interesting because they go stepwise darker slash more gray, more towards gray as you as these numbers increase on the side. So like CN or cyan, cyan one is like a little bit more gray than cyan, cyan two is a little bit more gray than cyan one and so on. So you can use them also to get finer distinctions between very similar colors that just vary based on like a little bit, a little bit darker. But if you want to use these colors, you have to use these um, scale scale commands. And that's where it becomes relevant if it's scale fill or scale color, and if it's gradient or manual. So fill and color, that depends on what your aesthetics are mapped to. It depends what's in the AES. So let me just scroll back up here. So it depends, you can look at what you called in your AES command to basically answer this question. So is it, did you map the thing to color or did you map it to fill? Or if you want to do both, you have to do it in two separate lines. Um, and then you have to pick between manual and gradient. So like I said, manual is used for categories or discrete units. And for this, that means that you have to provide the right amount of colors. Okay, so if you have three different groups, you can't provide two colors, you need to provide three colors. And so looking again at this one, so we keep track of which one is which, our Penguin's Island, we can see here, this is clearly a case of categories. So there's big groups. It's not nothing to do with a scale, like um, a range. And we can see that it's using three colors. So we can replace those with three colors. So for this, we use plus scale fill manual. Um, and then we do values equals and give an array. So this is an array that that's why it starts with the C command um, that shows that these things are together as one unit in an array. And then you can give the appropriate number of colors. So I've taken colors here from the ggplot base colors. And if I run this, then you'll see that it maps them um, yeah, onto the categories. And it's doing this based on the order of the levels. So here it's alphabetical. So that's why it's like green and then yellow and then blue. So these are the colors um, from, from the base R. So we can try that again. So say we want the same plot and we want to change those colors around, then you just have to give yeah three different color names in the values argument. Um, yes. Sorry, um, Yulia, can you take over for me for one second? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes. All right, so I'll share. Do you want me to share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, all right. Let me find my R Studio. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, here we are. I think that was the example that Kaida stopped at, right? So you can pick kind of any any colors you would like in here. Um, actually, if you pick too many, I think it's not a problem. You just have to have at minimum three because we have three um, levels in this factor. Okay, so this was fill because bar charts have these yeah, I've just used the fill aesthetic, um, but we can add color. So you, just to show you that this works in kind of two separate steps for scale fill manual and scale color manual. So first I'll just run this part first. So we're adding kind of color. It's not really visible, but we're adding an outline around these bars. And then we can give these uh, different colors. So here, you can see that for fill, so for these the bars, for the larger areas, we've used a slightly lighter color. So that ends with three and two. And then for color, which are the outlines around the bars, we've used similar colors, but a slightly darker version, right? I hope you can kind of see that, that this is a, has a slightly darker outline. Right. Should I continue or do you want to take back over? Um, I can take back, sorry. <laughs> All right, no worries. <laughs> there was, um, okay. okay, so you showed this it, part, right? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, okay, yeah, so that shows with the fill and the color. And I think I heard Julia also explaining that it's slightly darker and I did that just by like upping each of these numbers one step. Yeah. Okay, so that was all with um, scale fill manual and scale color manual. But we also have gradient and gradient is when we want to give like a range of colors that it should vary along based on the values in a certain column. So because this is like a scale that goes from one color to the other, you always have to set, or you should set which one is the low value and which one is the high value. So where you want the scale to start and, and end. And um, yeah, what it means by low is that the value in that column is low. So it doesn't, even if you had like the plot upside down, it would match with the lower numeric values in that column. Um, and, and this could not be applied to something like a factor, it would have to be applied to something that yeah, is numeric or scalable. Okay, so here I have this penguin's flipper, which again is our scatter plot. But instead of doing from dark blue to light blue, we I've set here that I want the low values to be this color khaki and the high values to be the color pink. And you'll see that just like replaces it and sets the lower values to this, like khaki is kind of this yellow color in R and this is the pink color. And then in between it mixes to make this like orange. So I could have also done that the other way around. So if I give the low value being the pink and the high value being the khaki color, then we just get the same thing, but switched around. Yeah. So there, the important thing to just notice is if you're working with something numeric or on a scale, then you have to set what the low and the high points of the scale are and give only two colors. Whereas if you're working with the discrete, like you saw, you had to give multiple, um, give the right amount of colors for the amount of categories that you have for manual. Now there's a couple of variations on scale color gradient, which are kind of cool. Um, this one is scale color gradient two. And it allows you to give a low point and a high point and a midpoint. And you can set exactly where you want that midpoint to be. So here we've done yellow to blue and the mid color should be gray and it should be around 5,000. 5,000. Yeah, because it's for body mass, so for the Y axis. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I, was like, I was looking at the X axis and confused. Yes, okay, good point. Mm -hmm. So it's around here. Oh yeah, and there you also see the gray points. Mm -hmm. And we could move that around like if we wanted to just play with it. So you could move the midpoint to 4,000 or if there's a certain range that you want to emphasize, you can 
set that range and you can see how it sets the colors above it to always be kind of your higher colors and the ones below it to be the lower colors um like whatever you've given here is low or maybe you want to set a midpoint that's the average of the data or some kind of a national average if, you, if you're working with maps or something like that mm -hmm. yeah like a way to emphasize them because you could also pick a color that's like higher contrast and be able to point them out And there's also one called scale color gradient N, and that allows you to give more than just a high point and a low point, but rather like a lot of colors that it should kind of transition between. Um, it's kind of hard, yeah. To, yeah, you can see that here it starts with dark blue and then it transitions to red and then to gray, to orange and to yellow. And you could change any of those um, based on, yeah, and it would just, allows you to give multiple colors. And you can see that they go in the order of what you've given here. So that's um, scale color gradient N. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about is hex codes. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe we should um, yeah. cover those first. Um, so if there are several factor variables in the data, uh, maybe species and sex, which of the two does R choose for assigning the colors that I specify manually? Does it depend on the number of colors I give? So if I give two, it'll color by sex, and if I give three, by species? Uh, so R will actually not try to assign it for you, but you have to actually do it manually. So if we look at, yes, this one. Maybe it's a little bit harder to tell because I've hidden some of the code in this penguins island <laughs> call so this penguins island is the entire rest of the code for this ggplot and the thing i've added here is that fill is equal to species and this is the last one i've done this is why i've like assigned it back over top so in this code in this plot we've already said that if i'm if i'm doing anything with fill it needs to be by species and it will already do that for you in default colors first and then you add like the custom colors over top of the, the default colors so just by adding fill equals species to our um to, like to our penguins island ggplot code here we've already set it in stone that it should be filled that's uh, sorry it should be species that's dealt with by color and yeah then it's up to you to pick the the right amount of colors i think it will i think it will complain if you give the wrong amount of colors um but i don't know if i actually have tried it yeah, so then it tells me that I need three colors, but I only gave two because I have these three different uh, penguins or species that, that I'm trying to map. Yeah, does that um, clarify that? Yes, thank you. And another mm -hmm. question, can I use a formula to define the midpoint? So in this um, gradient um, that lets you uh, pick a midpoint, so scale color gradient two. Um, Let's try. So here you can like do simple stuff like this is um, just quickly calculating the mean, or we could use the median, which I guess is actually significantly lower there. So things like that work. And I think anything that returns a numeric like a number in R should probably work. So I think you could create some sort of um, function that returns a certain value, or you can use any of this, these sort of default things, uh, default functions that return numbers. So you can see that this returns an, um, a number. Anything else? Uh, no, nothing right now. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to keep working with um, scale, fill, scale, color, manual, and gradient. But now we're going to work with hex codes. So hex codes are always represented by this hashtag symbol and then six digits, which combined any number as well as the letters A to F. And this expresses like red, green, blue values of colors. Um, so RGB values. And you see this a lot in a lot of applications on the internet um, or just in general with coding like for example, in HTML, you can use hex codes to define a color, but it's kind of a systematic way that you can work with color um, online or on computers that, oh, yeah, you can pick any any color that way. 
Okay, that will be more clear when we show it. So I'm gonna show you this site that I use often, which is called htmlcolorcodes.com. And this allows you to play with this sort of color wheel. Um, and this is the color that you're, you're currently looking at. So if I wanted to pick like a really deep wine red, I could kind of look around for the, the right color. Oops. And then when you find something you like, this is this first line here is the hex code that responds uh, that corresponds to that color. So yeah, and you can see this is kind of set up the same way as the base R colors that it progresses into gray on this side, or as it stays more vibrantly colored here, and it goes from lighter to darker. And with this, you should be able to theoretically find any color um, that you can imagine. And there are also sites, I don't think this one does it, that will give you, will allow you to like upload a photo and then you can use like a dropper tool and, and find the hex code for that. So, which I didn't, I didn't link, but um, if you just Google for like hex code finder, then you can easily like upload a picture and find a, find a color. So if you're going off of some sort of inspiration, like an album cover or something, then you can um, find the exact code for the right color. So this is one way to do it. Um, then another one that we, used for a lot, or actually I think we heard of from um, Julia Silgi, is this mycolor.space. And in this one, you can start with a color, which you can either give or you can find here. It's a little bit smaller, so it's a little bit more tricky to use, but it's still good. So let's see, let's see, what am I feeling? Maybe like an orange color. Um, so once you find a color that you like, don't know if I like that, but you click on generate, you get um, a whole bunch of options for like color palettes that work with that color. So here, this one is a, a gradient. So it goes from this orange to sort of its opposite color on the color wheel, which is this turquoise. And it gives you some stops in between. Ooh, that one's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit difficult on the eyes, but <laughs> this is a matching gradient. I don't know how they came up with that one. Um, I guess because it's the same lightness, whereas this one gets darker. Yeah, they basically give you a lot of palettes and you can look through them. <laughs> wow, I really picked an ugly color for this, for this example. Um, but it works with any color that you pick. Let's try this one. And this is just a good way to get like somehow inspired for what kind of colors you could work with on your TG plot. <laughs> this one's very classy cube switch. Okay, but the good thing is that these automatically show the hex codes right underneath them. So it's really, really easy to use them. So you can very easily kind of get a visual of how your colors will look together in your plot. And then you can pick the colors directly based on the hex codes. Okay, now you have your hex codes. Now what? And this is really easy because you can use your hex codes exactly the same way as we did above with these R um, base colors. And that you just have to pick between fill and color and manual and gradient. And when you have the correct um, function, then you just give values and you give the hex codes. So they do have to be preceded by this, this hashtag. If they're not, it won't understand what the color is. But if it's preceded by the hashtag, then R knows that it's a hex code. So let's look again at Penguin's Island, which is our bar chart. And we want to color these to these three hex colors. Uh, yeah, so here we have like a dark blue, a dark purple, and some sort of a light blue. But these are the colors that are denoted by these hex codes. And we can also do this with gradient. So if we look again at our scatter plot and we set the low and the high values to these two hex codes, then we have yeah, the scale from one to the other. So the good thing about this is it just at, allows you for a lot of flexibility. And I think with these little drag and drop tools, it's really easy to find the hex code that you're looking for and, and design it that way. Um, there's a couple of things you can think about or kind of keep in mind is, so for example, here we picked two colors that are really close to each other on the color wheel. So I don't know if you've never thought about the color wheel before, it's kind of in the order of the rainbow, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, um, to put it very simply. And so here we picked green and blue, which are really close to each other. And then you can see that they transition into each other smoothly. So it goes really from green to darker green to something that's hard to say if it's green or blue to blue. But if you pick colors that are kind of far apart from each other, like green and red, 
then you get like a little bit of a different mixing in the middle. Same like if, if you mix paint colors that like you mix green and red, you get this kind of orangey brown in the middle, which um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just depends on what you're, what you're going for in terms of wanting it to look like a smooth transition or wanting to kind of emphasize this a little bit more emphasis, a little bit more emphasis on the extremes. Um, of course, this is a very bad choice in practice because um, a, a gradient from red to green along um, the same intensity is a classic, yeah, troublesome color palette for certain types of vision or certain types of color blindness. So uh, not necessarily a good option to use red and green here, but um, yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. Yeah, are there any questions to hex codes before I go on? Um, no, I don't see any right now. Okay. I'm sure there's plenty of people in the audience that are better able to choose colors <laughs> than me. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I think so, people will spend a long time on these um, websites yeah. where you can pick colors and make color palettes. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And the thing with picking the colors from an image is also really fun because then you can, like, say you do a Tiny Tuesday and then you post it on Twitter. You can put like your inspiration picture next to it, or um, you can use a, a picture that is similar to the topic. Like if you were doing some sort of forest, you could pick colors from a forest picture or whatever. Okay, so you can use, um, I've showed you how to use hex codes and the R inbuilt color options for uh, our aesthetic mappings. But you can also change a lot of other parameters about the ggplot. So I'm gonna show how to do all of these. And these often take place within the theme command, or the theme function. And the theme command is a place um, I don't always like to tread because I find it to be a little bit messy find it to be a little bit difficult. It seems that seems to be when I have to hit stack overflow. So I'm trying to make it simplify how it works here in that you open the theme command and then within it, you have different descriptions of the part of the plot you want, usually with a dot. So panel background or panel grid, title, access text. So it's always separated with a dot if there will be a space. And then it's equal to one of these element commands. So it's either element rect or element rectangle. If it's something that looks like a rectangle, uh, element text or element line. And then once you're within that, so once you've said equals to element rect or um, line or whatever, then you have fill in color just like you would in a ggplot with the fill being for big areas and the color being for small areas. So you don't have to, understand that off the top of your head, but just so that it's a little bit clearer when we go through the code, that a lot of these things happen within the theme command. Um, and then you have the description of what part of the plot it is, and then it's equal to one of these one of these elements. So that's just the way that it works. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the background. So for that, we can do plus, um, L, yeah, theme, so open up the theme, and we'll set the panel background to be filled in the color dark red. I'm actually gonna do a little bit and coming it down here. So now you can see, I've, I'm, I'm gonna go through all the stuff in red so that you can clearly see what part of the plot it's, it's referring to. But here uh, you can see that it's the entire background of the plot, but not the whole image, just of the like, plot space. So that's uh, panel background. Now I'm gonna um, put that like a, I don't, I don't, don't worry about the color choices in this example. Consider them like um, mermaid colors. <laughs> I think I was having a little bit of fun on this, but here I've made like a not very visible light purple background, dusty purple background. And that's the same thing. So theme and then you get panel background is equal to element, so a certain element with a certain fill. Now, if we, we can also um, put a color here. So not just fill, but also color within element rect and that will just change the outline to the plot. So that would be, which is the same concept as when we worked with bar plots that fill was the big interior space and um, color was this small line outline. Um, we can also add, so now I've dropped down a line but I'm still within the theme command here. So, but I've added to the theme command panel.grid. So panel grid, will be the grid lines. So if we set them 
um, to red. We'll look at that in a second, but just note that here it's element line because grids are lines and they're not rectangles, as far as I understand. So here you can see the element grid. You can set those. You can set the color of those as well. Um, here I've gone ahead and set them to gray. And then I've added another thing here, which is the title, which is a text. So we use element text, but then we have, um, so I'll just show you how it looks and then we'll look at the code. So that just lights up these, these titles. And this looks like a little bit, yeah, it's a lot of code and it's kind of not very um, easy to see, but I've tried to separate the part out that is necessary into the comments. And also very often when I work on something like this, I kind of write them all down and then put them all in and then just change them as I go, like copy and paste something like this. Um, so here, that was title, but we could also do access text. So here I've just replaced title with access text and that will change the color of like these markers. Um, I don't need either of those, so I took them off. And then there's also a final one is plot background. So we had panel background before, that's what I've made pink here, but we can also change the plot background and that will change like this entire rest of the area of the image. And you can see this was also a rectangular element and it also has a fill in a color command. And so I've done light gray with a dark gray border. So the border is really um, very hard to see, but that's just that little line there. Okay, so you can see here, I've mixed and matched also hex codes. It doesn't matter if you mix and match hex codes with our base um, options. So you can use hex codes or inbuilt options. Yeah, it doesn't matter. They both work the same. Just remember that when you're working with hex codes, it's preceded with this um, hashtag. Here's our final <laughs> mermaid chart. Yeah, are there any questions on that? Yeah, there's a question if um, in the theme options, we can also um, italicize text, not just color it, but also make it bolder in italics. Yeah, so Julia, you know how to do that with the top of your head, don't you? <laughs> sure, well, let me let me test it first before I say something and it's wrong. Um, I would want to say that it's element markdown. No, no, I think kind of bold and italics, um, that kind of stuff still works just in in the normal theme. Uh, let me just try it. This is really a part of ggplot that always sends me to Stack Overflow. If you try face within element text, so face equals bold, I could get to work. So making it bold. Oh, yeah. Italics, it doesn't like. Maybe it's just a slightly different um, it's command face. for italics. It's Oh, it's also line type. Oh, this is so cool to look into here. There's a lot. There are italics. Lot of oh, just italic. Okay, I tried italics. Okay. Oh, yeah. So there's also bold, bold italic. Um, and there's some cool stuff in here too, because like, for example, I saw when I was scrolling line type. So that means that you could change these axis ticks to be dashed, for example. Um, yeah, or the grid to be dashed or dotted or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for example. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on within the theme command and you can personalize a lot of stuff in there. At some point, just um, Google it rather than trying to <laughs> tax your brain on all of the options of theme, but it's also good to yeah look at the, the documentation. Yeah, cool I tend bit. to just have a, a code snippet with all the, the, the different theme options. Um, and then just copy paste that because mm -hmm. I, there's no way I can remember all of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing that you would look for in the documentation there would be something like element text. That's kind of like the level that would give you the options. So that's what I had pulled up here. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, but good question. Um, anything else? Nope. Okay, then I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, it's my turn again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right, so we're switching gears a little bit now. So 
up until now, we've used colors that we've picked ourselves. So either the R base colors or hex codes. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about ready-made color palettes that other people have created and that um, you can use. And I'll talk uh, through our color brewer and Viridis. And these are two options that might be more familiar that you might have uh, seen before. And then I'll also talk about kind of more, more niche, um, really fun color palettes. Okay, so first, um, Color Brewer. So this is a package that you can um, install that you should install if you haven't done that already, and then load it. And this just contains a bunch of color palettes. So let's have a look at all of these. Just try to open that in a bigger window so we can see it a bit better. Okay, so these are all the color palettes, right? So here you can see that we have kind of three groups. So the first one is, for example, the first one is yellow to orange to red. Um, and you can see that these are, so this is the first group where it tends to go from lighter color to a darker version of the same or a similar color. Um, so these are good for numeric variables where you want to um, yeah, go from a low to a high value. So those would be good for that. And then the second group here in the middle, it starts with set three and ends with accent. These would be good for um, categorical variables, so different groups, because these colors are very different from each other. So that's always good when you have uh, lots of different groups you want to visualize. And then the third group of color palettes, the one at the bottom, you can see that these have, so for in the middle, they are really light, so even white or like light gray. And then on both ends, they tend to have a dark color. So for example, uh, the second one here goes from red to kind of yellow, light yellow, to then green and dark green. So kind of three different um, groups of these color palettes. And um, this first group is called sequential, right? So these are good for, for gradients if you have numeric data from low to high. And then the second group is called qualitative. So the middle group, that's good for categories. And the third one is called diverging. So that's nice if you have some kind of a, of a meaningful average that you want to show in a light color and then you want to show the extremes in darker colors. Okay, so again we need to think about if we're using color or fill in the aesthetics and we also need to think about what kind of data do we have. Is it discrete, so categories, or continuous numeric? So we'll start with discrete data, categories. So just a reminder that this is the plot so this is the default that we have, um, build length and build depth. And we have these three groups, so three species. Um, and we, we just need to pick um, a palette. And I'll just show examples from these three different groups so, so you can see how they look. Yeah, how they look different. So here we have both fill and color. So fill is um, the standard, standard errors around the, the line um, and color the point and the line itself. So we need both scale color and scale fill. And here, because we're using um, palettes from Color Brewer, it's scale color brewer instead of um, manual and scale fill brewer instead of, instead of scale fill manual. Um, and then the only thing you need to do is pick which palette you like. So that's just an additional argument in the brackets, palette equals, and then the name of the palette in quotation marks. So just as you had them in this, um, yeah, in this overview, and I've also written them here because it's a little bit hard to read sometimes. Okay, so let's try that. All right, so this is a, a gradient color, maybe not the most appropriate for um, categories. Okay. So this is probably a bit better for categories. This is from the second set. Um, that's the dark two color palette. And then also one from the diverging. And here you can see that it, the middle group here gets a really light color because this is, is a diverging color palette. So you can see that probably a color palette from this middle group here. So this group is best. And we can also maybe try uh, try a different one, just see what it looks like. So you can just put 
the name of the color palette in here and it'll change that for you. Okay, and something you can also do is you can switch around the order of the colors. So just a reminder, if we just pick palette equals spectral, that's what it looks like. So the highest uh, group here is orange, then light yellow and green. And if we add an additional argument, direction equals minus one for both uh, color and fill, it just switches that. So it starts with green, yellow, orange. Okay, so just a comparison, this is the, the default. And then if we just want to switch around the colors, we add direction equals minus one, and it looks like this. Okay, so that was discrete data, so categories. Um, for continuous data, you need to use scale color or scale fill distiller. So instead of brewer, which was for categories, you use distiller. But then the same thing. So you have palette, greens, or palette, accent. I'll just show you what it looks like. So just as a reminder, the original plot looked like this. So that's where we had body mass just additionally color coded. And this is more for visual interest. We're not adding a variable. It's just to make it look a bit more interesting. So let's add a green palette. Looks like this. And uh, let's look at the accent palette. And you can see here the accent palette is meant for categories. So this is, looks a bit messy if you put it on uh, numeric data. And then let's use red, yellow, blue, I think is what that is. Yeah. And this is one of these diverging palettes where the mid values are really light and then the more extreme higher and lower values are really dark. And again, you can add this direction um, argument. And here you just have to, it's a little bit confusing and a little bit annoying, but here you have to do direction is one, not minus one to flip the palette. So this is the default. So blue to red. And if we add direction, it goes red to blue. All right. Yeah. Questions before I move on? Yeah. So there's a question. So um, if you name the color palette, do you pick the range of the color from the legend you showed us? So if I pick, yeah, if I pick the color um, palette, uh, our color brewer will kind of do the rest of the work for me. So it'll automatically, if, if it's continuous data, it'll automatically kind of smooth it out. So it goes from light, for example, light to dark. So I just pick, I just pick what I want and if, if there aren't enough um, values. So for example, these uh, qualitative color palettes, they have a limited number of values and um, our color brewer will just pick values from that. And you have to be careful that if you have lots and lots of categories and you pick um, a palette that only has five or six or seven colors, it'll complain again. But um, most of this, you just pick a, a palette that you like and then our color brewer does most of the rest of the work. Great. I think that's the only question. All right. Okay. All right. So that's uh, Color Brewer. And then the second package would be Viridus. So that's also some a package that most of you might have heard of or maybe used. It's a really popular one. It's, it is really popular because the colors are not only pretty, but they are also um, readable even if people are colorblind or even if you print it in grayscale. So if you have a printer that can only do that only has black ink um, and you have a beautiful colorful plot um, and you print it you might not yeah you might not see any differences anymore so these are the palettes that Viridus has all right so these not as many but they are really nice and really useful and they do have a rainbow um, palette <laughs> So the commands um, are again, really similar. So you need to think about color or fill. And then because this is from the Veritas package and I do have to load it as well and install it if you don't have it installed yet. Um, so it's scale color Veritas or scale fill Veritas. Um, and then they have an option argument which lets you pick the palette. So we'll start with the flipper data. So again, that's what that looks like by default. Um, and I'll pick the Inferno um, palette. So that's this one. 
and we'll just see what that looks like. As you can see, that goes from really dark purple to red, orange, yellow. And let's just try two other palettes from this package just so you can see what they look like. So this is also kind of purple-ish, blue, green. And then here's the rainbow. <laughs> All right, so this is continuous data. Um, if you have a discrete variable, so a category, you have to add discrete equals true as an additional argument, right? So you use, again, scale color or scale fill viridis. And then because penguins build, so that's again, that's this plot, because we have three species, we just have to add discrete true in both scale color and scale fill. Right, and then it looks like that. If you don't specify anything in option, it'll just pick the first palette that it's also, yeah, same as the package name, it's just a Viridus palette, which is also really nice. But we can change it so we can pick this, this palette again. And there we go. Probably not ideal because this is very light in color. But just so you know, you can change this. Uh, maybe I'll make try that. <laughs> OK. Questions on Veritas? Um, actually, there is one. Mm -hmm. So how do you scale continuous for the values of y such that higher values take a darker shade? Mm -hmm. um, so good question. Let's see. So if you wanted to switch this, I think we might be able to just do direction again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, again, this direction argument. So I'll remove it just so you see what it looks like. So here it goes from purple to yellow. And then if I, oops, if I add direction equals minus one, it flips that around and now it goes from yellow to purple. And so you can add that to any, any palette you like. We could look at this one again. So here it starts with um, purple, blue goes to red. And now we switch it around. Yeah, and they're also asking about what about in the discrete case? I think that should work the same way. Let's just take this one. Oh, there's also. Yeah. Um, so, so for example, like if you had your three K, you had your three discrete species groups mm -hmm. and you wanted to color them around the mean of that group. Like the dots, um, for example, like the dots in these three species, if we could mm -hmm. color them around the mean of that species. Mm -hmm. So that when they diverge from the mean, the more they diverge, or, oh. hmm. Yeah, I'd have to look into that. I think that might get a little bit trickier. It's probably possible. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Let me explain what I meant was like mm -hmm. your previous graph, but on this graph. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So you, so this graph on this graph? Yeah, so like the Adele could be like the, the top values of 20 could be a darker shade. I know I'm asking a really like complex question. So don't worry if this is not serving everyone else. Yeah, um, I think that's, possible i know i mean for graphs like these that's for sure possible um with the groupings it might get a little tricky i'd have to look into that um but it's an interesting question so if i manage it maybe i'll look into that while you do the exercises yeah it's an interesting question yeah uh, yeah i'll have to think about that you could maybe facet wrap it and then it might be easier yeah, but I have to play around. <laughs> Don't have an immediate answer. But um, yeah, if the question is, can you do this in ggplot? The answer is usually yes, because ggplot is really cool. <laughs> All right. Any other questions right now, or should we move on? All right. OK, so um, Color Brewer and Veritas are pretty popular and pretty widely used. Um, 
but there are color palettes based on pretty much anything. So based on the colors in films, for example, um, or kind of a personal favorite of mine is this um, Dutch Masters package, which is based on um, paintings. So there are lots and lots of packages. Uh, you can also just Google and see if someone made a package based on your favorite film or book or band. There are also band um, kind of album cover based color palettes. So um, people make lots of packages that you can download, install and use. Um, but there's also a package called Paletteer, um, which is by Emil Whitfeld. Uh, so what he did was collect a bunch of these different packages and put them into this um, Paletia package. So that's, I thought we'd just explore that a little bit because instead of having to install 200 different packages, um, well, not 259 <laughs> different packages, he just collected um, these packages. Um, all right, so you can just, oh, my cat is joining the party. That's great. Hello. Um, so you can just, can just install um, that package and then load it just like you would any other package. And we'll just have a look at, um, so you can just follow this link to this GitHub. Yeah, just so you get an idea of how many um, options you have for this. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll get to a section that's called included packages. And there you can scroll through and see which which packages are included here. So there's one on based on Beyonce, there's the Dutch masters that I like so much. There's one based on uh, Game of Thrones as well, and so on. Um, there's a suffragist, suffragette um, package, which is based on this kind of um, green and purple colors that the suffragettes use. There's one of, on Taylor Swift, I think album cover. So lots and lots and lots of options. So I thought I'd show you how to use that because if you can use that package, you have, how many was it? Uh, 2000, more than 2000 palettes at your disposal. So how do you use it? Um, it's really similar to what we've been talking about so far. Um, you need to know if it's color or fill, and then you need to know if it's discrete, so categories or continuous data. Um, and then you also need to specify, so in the brackets, so scale, color, or fill, palette and then D for discrete or C for continuous, you need to say which package the palette should be from and what the palette name is. Okay, so we'll just jump into an example. So we'll look at this graph, um, the flipper length body mass, and I would like to use the Berlin palette from the Psycho package. Right, so I have to type in quotation marks, um, psycho, that's the name of the package, then these two colons, and then the name of the palette, Berlin. All right, and then that's what it looks like. So this is actually kind of dark in the middle, and then uh, lower values are blue and higher are kind of reddish. Yeah, dark red. Okay, so if we wanted a different palette from the same package, we would again write Psycho and then Vic, that's another, another palette. And then here we have another diverging palette where the middle is light and um, extreme values are uh, darker. Okay, then Dutch Masters, one of my favorites has, uh, so this is based on different paintings and you might know this um, girl, I think it's girl with a pearl earring painting and it's just based on the colors that are in that. So the package is Dutch Masters and the palette is pearl earring. There we go. And because this is um, discrete, so here we have the groups, species, I've used um, scale, color, and fill palette here underscore D for discrete. And just a few more examples, and you'll have time to play around with that. So here's a nice greenish um, palette. Uh, this is Wes Anderson Films Darjeeling one. It's really bright and nice looking. And this is based on um, 
rock album covers. So rock themes is the package and Alice is the palette name. So that's how you use that. Um, and here it's really important. So some, pa uh, some palettes are only available for continuous data, some only for discrete data. So if you use the wrong um, palette, it'll complain. So this won't work. So this is continuous data. And I'm trying to use a palette that is only for discrete data. And it'll say palette not found. So how do you know if there are 2000 and something palettes, how do you know which are good for which kind of data? So here's a, um, here are the two commands you need, palettes underscore C underscore names. So that's just which palettes are available for continuous data. So here you can see the package name, the palette name. You can also see what type it is. So sequential, that's when it goes from a light shade to a dark shade and diverging, that's when the middle is usually a lighter color and the extremes are usually a darker color. Okay, so you can see, so this is a data frame that we can search through and I'll show you in a second how. You can see there are 330 um, palettes for continuous. So not as many as for discrete, there are more color palettes in here for discrete data to more, yeah, over 2000. All right. So that's good for knowing which palettes are available, but you can also, so here on this GitHub page, you can, um, yeah, follow the link. And they will usually have a showcase of what the palettes look like. Um, right, so because this is a tipple, so something similar to a data frame, we can look through that. So if you know that you would like something from the psycho package um, and you want uh, the palette to be diverging, you can just use a filter. So I'm using palette, palettes C names. And then I'm saying um, limit that to the package psycho and the type should be diverging. And then I get all the options from that um, package and it's neat because I can just copy paste it and won't have any typos. Okay. Yeah, questions on that? Okay. All right. So then before we kind of let you lose and let you play with the colors and make your own plots, uh, we wanted to talk quickly about a couple of points that you um, might want to keep in mind when you're choosing colors for your plots or when you're, when you're making visualizations more generally. So the first is that um, colors are not neutral. So just culturally, they are often not neutral. Um, we often have some kind of an emotion or some kind of a meaning um, associated with them and this is so just a couple of points and they are largely based on a blog post uh, by Cedric Scherer who is a data visualization uh, icon I would say <laughs> who makes really nice data visualizations and um, so some things he points out there is that for example black is often associated with death in many cultures again this is culture specific or that when you show temperature if you show the temperature in red or hues of red, people think this is warmer than if you show the same values in blue because this is a cold color that's associated with rain and water. Um, and then another example to be aware of are um, colors and, and gender stereotypes. So you have these traditional stereotypes of blue and pink, right? If you go and buy some children's toys, everything's either blue or pink. And um, yeah, this is a really stereotyped color choice. So that's something you might want to rethink and just ideally, I think it's to just use completely different colors because if you just reverse it, so if you use blue for women, pink for men or red for men, people might misinterpret your graph because that's just so ingrained. Um, so here's a nice um, blog post um, that shows you a couple of ideas and that also goes through, um, I think how different news organizations in the US deal with showing um, gender uh, in graphs or what kind of colors they use. And there are a couple of nice ideas. Okay, um, and then we've already talked or we've already mentioned it a little bit. Um, many colors or color combinations are not colorblind friendly. And um, so how do you know if they are? So some packages, 
Verdes and Psycho, for example, they are all colorblind safe. Um, Color Brewer has some of them, or actually quite a lot of them are colorblind safe. And you can see them by just adding this colorblind friendly true argument to, to the display argument we used earlier. So these would also be colorblind friendly. Um, and if you're not sure, so if you're using custom colors or a different palette and you're not sure, um, there's a package, colorblinder, blind R, <laughs> that can kind of test this for you. And um, I couldn't get this to install properly. Luckily, there's also a link. And I figured we'd just quickly try that um, out. So the link leads to this website where you can just upload an image. And then it'll show you a preview of how, so how it would look in grayscale and how people with different forms of color blindness would see um, your graph and see your colors. So to do that, you need to know how, or you should, probably probably want to know how to save graphs. You can, of course, just do that manually, but um, we'll just create a really colorful graph and we're not sure if that's going to be a good idea. And we want to test that, so we, we want to save that first. So you can just use GG save. By default, that takes the plot that was displayed last and saves it. So you need to give it a name and then it'll save that. So this is saved just in the same place um, as my file is because it's a markdown. So markdown just sets the working directory to where you are, but you can also type in a whole path. So now it's saved as a PNG, which means that now I can, if I find the folder, <laughs> so bear with me, I can just upload that and we can have a little preview. Here we are. Right. Okay, so this is the original and then you can just click through here at the top. So desaturated grayscale, how would that look? And then these are different kinds of color blindness. So how would it show up um, for different people? And we can click through and have a look. So here you can see that this looks really similar to this color as well. And for if you click on all, you can have just an overview of all of these. So that's, that's a really handy tool that I wanted to mention. And then when we talk about accessibility, I also wanted to mention alt text. So that's relevant when you post your visualizations on Twitter. So when you, for example, participate in, in Tidy Tuesday, um, it's kind of like a custom that you, you post your graph on Twitter um, and people who are blind or who are visually impaired, um, they often use screen readers to have Twitter or whatever they're looking at read out to them. And um, if there's a, just a graph, they, that just doesn't, the screen reader can't deal with that, but you can add what's called alt text. So that's just a quick description of your graph. And uh, here's a medium post that explains that a little bit more and that has a handy formula. So you should mention the chart type, um, which variables, what does it show? So why is it interesting? And then also a uh, link to the data or say where the data is from. So if we wanted to um, have a go with the penguins flipper graph, we could write something like scatter plot of um, penguin flipper length by body mass, where um, as flipper length increases, so does body mass and then data via Tidy Tuesday GitHub and a link. So just a quick um, example. All right. Yeah, any questions? All right, great. So then I think I'll hand back over to Kyla to explain the exercises. Kylie, you are muted. Thank you. Okay. Um, now for some exercises. So for this, I thought it would be kind of fun to take the most recent Tidy Tuesday data. So the stuff that I believe was posted today, it's a take Tidy Tuesday um, data set based on Paralympic medals. So it actually only spans from 1980 to 2016. I'm not sure um, if this year's 
yeah, if the 2020 ones maybe didn't take place. But um, you can see a little bit more about the data here. I'll just go over it quickly, but you can take a look at it. Um, here is also to read it in. And basically, it's a relatively straightforward data set in that it has like the gender of the event. This is on, I think it's either men, women, or mixed based on how the Paralympic Committee designated that um, competition, I think. I don't think it's like the person's gender. And then there's the events data. It tells you what medal the person got, what their name is, the abbreviation of the country, the country they're from. Um, and then there's a little bit more information about the type of medal that there was and the year. And the column guide is if there was a guide. So if someone like in the blind marathon, they have like a guide runner, for example. Um, the only problem with this data, it's a little bit messier than I originally anticipated when I loaded it in. So I've done a little bit of wrangling on it. Um, but basically what you have is a couple of UG, well, very standard plots. So this one I've made, for example, first I've made a, um, a little summary table, which shows types of swimming. So different strokes of swimming. Um, and then what yeah, the gender information, the year, and then the amount of medals that were won in general, or just the amount of people who won the medal in those in those disciplines. Basically, it was just to get to here, where we have a little um, graph that shows how many medals were given out in each event in each year. So you can see there in four-year increments, because the Olympics. And the idea here would just be to, to use it as a stage to try some different colors. So either try some of the inbuilt R options or the hex colors, or you can try palettes, you can change the backgrounds um, and so on. So that's just for you to kind of play with. I've done the same thing here, just that I've done the wrangling in line. So you can see I wrangle and then I go right into ggplot on this one. And this is an extremely um, simple plot, but when you add, a color argument to the aesthetics, it should divide it, it should kind of change the, the way that it works and divide it up by country. And then you can use that to try some colors out as well. So to try to make um, interesting colors. Here, all I've done is given you the summary table. So they get a little bit progressively harder. This one, I've done the wrangling, but I've left it to you to pipe it onto a graph. And this, I just have gender, year, and the number of medals that were won. And you can do what you want there, like a bar plot or a box plot or what, whatever you think is suitable to that type of data. Not really a right or wrong answer exactly there. And then the last one I've given is kind of a challenge. It's a big, it's a bit of a wrangling riddle. So if that's um, your thing, then you can try out this, this beast and see if you can end up with a plot that will end up looking like um, the amount of bronze, silver and gold medals won by a certain, certain countries. And then you can, of course, color them as well. So a little bit of wrangling happening, but don't worry about that. If wrangling isn't your thing, it should, should be able to mostly use it as a stage um, for colors. And feel free to ask us questions as well. I don't know if it gives you, yeah. Okay, so we can look at what I did for the um, exercises. Obviously there's a lot of variation with the colors and you could have done something totally different. Um, for the first one, so I, um, yeah, this one with the swimmers. What I added here was I decided to go with some hex codes. It's kind of my go-to. So I just picked three hex codes that I thought looked kind of watery um, and then I added the minimal as like a quick way to just get rid of the background and a lot of the yeah a lot of the um, text and stuff and then I actually bolded the text on the y-axis and removed the text from the x-axis and removed the axis ticks so those are kind of theme things that don't have to do with color um, but that gave me this nice clean plot that I think looks kind of aquatic. So I'm, I'm happy with that. So I just picked these from the hex code picker. And again, so I picked fill because I uh, mapped to fill. So it would be the whole bar. And um, I picked manual because it's categorical. So freeze trial, breaststroke and backstroke. 
Um, that's that one. Were there any questions to that one? Uh, no, I just put in the chat that there's, so our color brewer has this blues color palette that that's what I use because it's also, I was also thinking of water and blue. <laughs> so oh, right. just uh -huh. as an addition. I can also show that. Yeah, let's try that. So scale fill brewer and then the blues. Or did anybody else have anything that they came up with that they liked? You can post your code in the chat if you want and I can show it. Oh, look at that. That's also nice. <laughs> That's with the brewer blues. Yeah, okay. Um, then the countries one. So I had there before this kind of ugly plot. And what I first did was added, I mapped color to country. So let's get rid of this guy. This is, was the first step was to map color to country. Um, I picked a Wes Anderson palette here, which I don't know if I really like, but I wanted to try out um, one of those. And the good thing about those color palettes is that if I go ahead and like add another country. So before I was like clicking at Brazil, then it automatically updates. So if I would have done it with hex codes, I would have then had to go back, find another color and add it. So I thought in this case, it was easy to use like a West and like one of these palettes because um, it automatically had more options. But yeah, this isn't, yeah, maybe could have picked better colors. <laughs> oh yeah. Nice. Um, then for the gender one, I, um, I just did, actually a bar chart. So I mapped fill to gender and I did geom column with position dodge. And the reason that it's column and not bar is because I wanted to give the y axis to be the count. So geom bar only accepts one argument like the x axis and then it counts up number of rows. But since I already had that information, I used it as geom called. Maybe it could have been done either way. Um, then I did fill gender and I again, just provided hex codes with scale fill manual again. And I picked kind of like yellow and purple with a little bit of dark green. Um, yeah, any questions about those or anybody have something they want to share? I can show you the challenge question too. I don't know if anybody tried it. So the Okay, yeah, I'll show you the challenge question. And if in the meantime, you want to share some code, just put it in the chat and I'll, I'll run it after we can look at it. Um, so for the challenge code, I was, we started with the athletes data set. And then the first step was to filter it to um, include just a few countries. So, oh yeah, and I added this hint here where you could change the, the factor ordering of the metals to put it in the order that you would think of them in like bronze, silver, gold. So first I added that. So I mute, I changed the metal column to um, have the factors in the order of bronze, silver, gold. So in, in R, when you change the underlying factor orders, then that also changes how ggplot displays them. And then I filtered to have just a couple of countries. So I just picked a couple of countries in Europe to compare. Um, country in to select any of the multiple options. And so at this point, what I have is um, just the athletes data set, but it's just reduced to any countries that are, or any athletes that are in those countries. And then I group by the type of metal and the country so that I could return the number of rows. So if I add that group by and summarize call, then I get this summary table, which has just the metal, the country, and how many metals of that type were in that country. So that would have been like steps A and B here. And then I just did a ggplot. So a ggplot, I'll run it so you can see what it looks like. But I put the number of metals on the x axis and the type of metal on the y. I wish I could fit the code in the image here. Um, yeah, so here we go. So we have the number, yeah, the number on the X axis and the type on the Y, and then I had a different facet by country so that we could look at each country separately. 
Um, and then I tried to pick some colors that looked kind of like gold, silver, and bronze. That was a lot of wrangling, but um, yeah, it ended up being informative, I think. Yeah, did anybody have anything that they did or any questions before we wrap up? No, I don't see any questions right now. Let us know. <laughs> I was also asking if anyone has found a new favorite color or color palette <laughs> today. Yeah, Beek is sharing her metal colors. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, you can really just Google hex code bronze and it'll give you usually a nice option. Oh, wow. The internet's so helpful. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> So these colors, let's try this one. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. oh except that I have them in the wrong order because oh yeah. Um I guess you see it. And there's also a question I see about the squiggle in the um facet wrap and that oh there we go. <laughs> looks nice. Mm -hmm. And that is just showing that you want a, a separate panel for each country. So I don't know exactly. I think you can interpret the squiggle as meaning like by. So like have a different facet or a different panel by country. And that's what gives us um, the different graphs. So if we didn't have this whole entire line, then it would just be um, all of the, so how many gold, silver, and bronze in general. And by doing that, then we have it by country. So it's kind of just part of the syntax, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Great, then we can um, wrap it up. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'll stop recording. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, next meetup is actually in three weeks, uh, August 24th. And that will be another Guided Tidy Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks very much. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> Bye.